Quick, raise your hand if you know what Roe v. Wade is. Okay, now raise your hand if you know what R.V. Morgenthaler is. Fewer hands. That's okay, we can fix that. Welcome to Smitten with Learning. I'm Kenzie, and today we're going to talk about abortion in Canada, how the laws surrounding it have changed, some key court rulings, and how accessible it's been in the recent decades. So pack some snacks and hold your cats. Let's go. Canada has a pretty long history of criminalizing abortions. Starting in the early 19th century, Canada followed the legal precedents and statutes of the United Kingdom. For the sake of time, we jump to 1803, when the British Parliament passes the Malicious Shooting or Stabbing Act, also known as Lord Ellenborough's Act, which includes a section on abortion, outlawing any abortions after the quickening, or when the fetus first moves in the womb. If that sounds vague and hard to enforce, you are not wrong. Some British colonies, like New Brunswick, followed suit, passing laws that were nearly an exact copy of Lord Ellenborough. Yet, there weren't any reported abortion trials in Canada between 1810 and 1840, so it seems that New Brunswick's law wasn't applied much, if at all. In 1837, the British Parliament passed another law, the Offences Against the Person Act, which made all abortion illegal in the UK. Following this, Upper and Lower Canada got their own abortion criminalization laws in 1841 and 1859 respectively, which were quite similar to the UK's law. But these laws, along with ones in New Brunswick, PEI, and Newfoundland, mostly punished the person administering the abortion rather than the person receiving the abortion. This changed for New Brunswick in 1849, who, ever the frontrunner, made it a crime to administer an abortion and to receive one. And when Canada, as a fresh country, passed the first iteration of the Criminal Code in 1869, it included a very special Section 251, which essentially copied New Brunswick, making all abortions illegal nationwide. However, just because abortions were illegal doesn't mean abortions didn't happen. Apart from people administering their own abortions and intentional miscarriages at home in unsafe environments, one could still get illegal abortions in an unregulated commercial market and a rapidly developing abortifacients industry. That being said, illegal abortions were more accessible for those who were white or who had a disposable income to afford them. These issues in classism and racism continue to haunt Canadian abortion and will remain present throughout abortions legalization. Speaking of which, in 1969, the Liberal federal government amended Section 251 of the Criminal Code, and a class of therapeutic abortions became legal. But this was a far cry from modern abortion. Abortions were only allowed if necessary to protect the life of the mother. Abortions had to be performed in a hospital. A hospital committee, often heavily influenced by anti-abortion advocates, had to approve any abortions. There also wasn't any official government guidance or oversight when it came to the classist racial and social biases in the committees. What's more, abortion-seeking people didn't have a right to appear before these committees, and they were also under no obligation to provide any reasoning for their denials. The few who were approved found long wait times and faced abusive and degrading treatments while in hospital. And it was significantly harder to access these committee-based abortions for women of color, indigenous women, and women with disabilities. And most disturbingly, some abortions were only granted to women of color, and especially indigenous women, on the condition of their forced sterilization, a coercive, traumatic, and horrific practice that can still be found today. Altogether, the state of Canadian abortion in the 1970s was one of relatively few abortions, sifted through a filter of necessity, systematic denial, and pain. What changed? Well, First, we need to recognize that there have been decades of civil disobedience and resistance from thousands of women, feminists, and allies, all of which were instrumental in pushing the envelope on abortion rights in this country. And here is where we meet Dr. Henry Morgenthaler, a physician who established illegal clinics to administer safe abortions, sell contraceptives, perform vasectomies, and insert IUDs. In 1973, Morgenthaler opened his first clinic in Montreal and purposefully outed himself as a performer of illegal abortions, claiming that he had carried out over 5,000 abortions illegally. Shockingly, Morgenthaler got arrested, but was then acquitted three separate times by Quebec juries, wherein Morgenthaler defended his actions as a necessity, that his practicing of unlawful abortions was to avoid the greater harm of unsafe abortions. But in 74, the Quebec Court of Appeal, in a quite astonishing and pretty much unprecedented action, overruled a jury's decision and threw Morgenthaler in prison, where he stayed for almost a year. This case was appealed to the Supreme Court in Morgenthaler v. The Queen, where the SCC concurred with the Quebec Court of Appeals' assessment of the case, shooting down Morgenthaler's defense of necessity. Justice Pigeon, writing for the majority, argued that there was little evidence Morgenthaler couldn't comply with Section 251 of the Criminal Code, asserting that Morgenthaler hardly performed abortions for free and instead for profit in a private clinic with an unregulated market. 
Justice Dixon added in the majority opinion that Morgenthau's form of necessity can very easily become simply a mask for anarchy. So once Morgenthau got back out of prison, he hung up his white jacket, closed his clinics, and retired growing soybeans in Saskatchewan, not just kidding. He went and opened more abortion clinics, this time in Winnipeg and Toronto, which led to Morgenthau getting arrested again in 1983. This case, again, reached the Supreme Court in 1988 in the most important abortion case in Canadian history, R. V. Morgenthaler. But this time, instead of just examining Morgenthaler's criminal case, the Supreme Court was also examining the constitutionality of Section 251 as a whole. In a landmark ruling, the court found that Section 251 threatened the health of women by delaying and denying a person's access to an abortion. Or put complicated, Section 251 violated Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, or one's right to li life, liberty, and security of the person, a violation that could not be justified under the Notwithstanding Clause. This ruling essentially legalized all abortions in Canada at any point in a pregnancy for any reason, and was undoubtedly a big deal. However, the majority opinion still left the door open for any future anti-abortion legislation that was more careful in its creation, and that didn't violate the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Let's put a pin in that. So yeah. R.V. Morgenthaler is a big deal, but it's not the only important court ruling in Canadian abortion. There's also the 1989 case Tremblay v. Daigle, which upheld the right for someone to have an abortion regardless of the wishes of the fetus's biological father. The Supreme Court also found that fetuses do not become a legal person or attain the rights of a legal person until they are fully born. Second. There's the 1991 case R. V. Sullivan, which found that a person can't be charged with murder or homicide in the demise of a fetus. Now, remember that little pin we had? Yep. Abortion being fully legalized doesn't mean it was unthreatened. So, in 1990, the Progressive Conservative government passed Bill C-43 in the House of Commons, which would have sentenced doctors to two years jail time if they administered an abortion that was not for the health of the mother. But, in an unexpected twist, the bill died in the Senate in 1991? did not see that coming. Now, just because abortion was decriminalized doesn't mean it's exactly been easy for some people to get an abortion. In 2016, the UN Human Rights Commissioner identified barriers to receiving abortions in Canada and called on provincial and federal governments to address them. Today, the most important source of Canadian abortion inequity is in geography. Most abortion services in Canada are in urban centers, which makes it significantly harder for a person in rural Alberta to get an abortion compared to someone in, say, Calgary. In addition, some provinces straight up have wildly different levels of abortion access. For example, although abortion was decriminalized in 1988, there weren't any facilities administering abortions on Prince Edward Island until 2016. Note, the Confederation Bridge, uh, the bridge between PEI and the mainland, wasn't open to the public until 1997, so that's nine years where you had to get on a boat to get an abortion for anyone in PEI. And it's not just in abortion facilities, it's also in the geographical barriers of cost. Different provinces have different coverage of different forms of abortion. For example, Saskatchewan didn't cover mifepristone abortions until June 2019, the first oral drug for terminating pregnancies to be approved in Canada, even though it was approved in 2015, which had the notable advantage of being a pill prescribed by a physician, rather than needing to go to a specialized abortion facility. Mifepristone makes abortion significantly easier to access for rural Canadians, which, as you might expect, is pretty important for Saskatchewan. Abortion is also, broadly speaking, harder to access for people without access to their province's publicly funded healthcare system, who are not covered for abortion costs. Which in this case mainly concerns undocumented immigrants and certain refugees. And that about wraps up today's talk on Canadian abortion from total criminalization to full legalization and modern inequities. Amid the typhoon of American abortion politics, it's sometimes good to think about abortion's history here at home. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe for more loving videos about Canadian issues. Have a good one.